So this is our first lecture in Intro to Chemistry and I'm going to start the lecture by talking about some of the historical aspects that associate with chemistry. Dating all the way back to 3300 BC, this was known as the Stone Age. And the Stone Age, simply put, was uh, classified as the age in human civilization where the main available tool used to prepare uh, and construct monuments, construct weapons, and construct cities and citadels was basically stones, the stones that were around everywhere. And so humans, you know, started getting a little crafty and using stones to prepare their weapons, to prepare their, you know, um, their housing, anything that they might need to survive, right? So in these days, all the way back, right? So this kind of uh, takes you back to the Stone Age, right? <laughs> or the Ice Age. Uh, but as time goes by, Curiosity, you know, which is part of, you know, human nature, um, ultimately comes into eighth civilizations, at least some of them, because what happens is that as a result of curiosity, people start experimenting with the materials around them. And one of the experimentations that they had was uh, in the isolation of pure metals. And one of the first metals that got isolated were copper and tin, which present in their corresponding to uh, ores you could actually react with charcoal in the absence of oxygen to abstract the oxide present within the ore, thus leaving the pure metals. And not only that, not only could you isolate the copper and tin as pure metals, but if you heated them up at high enough temperatures, you could actually melt them and mix them together to form something known as an alloy, specifically a copper tin alloy known as bronze. What was found out is that bronze was a lot more durable, sturdy, and easy to um, change in terms of its shape to, you know, prepare weapons, prepare armor. Uh, and so this allowed many civilizations to ultimately build up empires, empires that they basically kind of took by force using uh, bronze, which was the better material to, like, fight your opponents, right? Because, you know, a sword versus a stone, you know, the sword's basically going to win each time. So we do have bronze, you know, to help us with all this. And, you know, this type of stuff also reminds me of God of War, you know, Kratos, you know, part three of the video game series. Uh, yeah, he did have bronze materials to attack. But as it turns out, that's not the best type of material to be using. There's other stuff that ultimately allow different empires to go even further. So when we go past the age 12 BC, which kind of gets down to the Roman Empire, in terms of the history, you know, human history, uh, what ended up happening is that up until this point, trying to isolate and purify iron from its ore was impossible. Uh, you just couldn't make it happen. And the reason why that was the case is because back before the Iron Age started, you know, taking place, the, the furnaces used to purify the iron and the metals weren't of the right material to withstand the temperatures necessary to actually get iron away from oxygen. And it wasn't until this, the right ceramic was prepared to, you know, um, prepare the proper furnace that iron was finally isolated. And the process is kind of cool because typically what you do nowadays is you add your iron ore, which is an iron oxide uh, source of some kind, and you mix it with other uh, salts like calcium carbonate and even sand. And you basically heat this up to really hot temperatures. You know, we're talking about 1500, 2000 degrees centigrade. And um, in the process of heating this up while keeping oxygen out, um, so long as you add carbon to this process or carbon monoxide, you have those, that particular carbon source removing oxygen from iron in the different steps that are depicted here. At the end of the process, however, iron is isolated as a pure metal and the temperature is high enough that the iron melts and it sinks to the bottom of this furnace. You can actually collect it through this outlet at the very bottom of the furnace itself. Anything that sits on top of the iron gets uh, removed from the upper portion right here uh, and it's known as lag. 
Now, needless to say, the iron that we get is a lot more durable, a lot more sturdy, and a lot more lethal than bronze. So the civilizations that developed the process of um, purifying iron from its ore became you know, the big empires that we know, such as the Roman Empire, right? So, uh, and that's not the only empire, by the way, that was able to isolate iron and take advantage of. You also had uh, Sauron, you know, trying to utilize all the iron that he could get his hands on to, you know, take care and take over Middle Earth. And then, of course, you have um, Tony Stark, on the other hand, you know, getting as much iron as possible to, you know, to beat up the poor Hulk, right? So, <laughs> different purposes for the same material. But the point is that the different techniques in chemistry allow for big changes in society to occur. And another historical aspect of chemistry that happens during the Iron Age, which is, uh, or, you know, kind of in between the Iron Age and modern age, is uh, alchemy. Alchemy is like the, the younger version of chemistry, except that it was not as well put together. Um, the idea back then was that we had four main elements, air, fire, earth, and water. And there were properties associated with each one of those elements in combination with each other, like air and water gives you wetness, air and fire gives you hotness, fire and earth gives you dryness, and earth and water gives you coldness. Um, so these were kind of the properties, but more important than that was the idea that within the air lied something called the ether. And within the ether, there was this pure um, gem known as the Philosopher's Stone. And so the alchemists were trying to, they were basically experimenting with chemicals in the hopes that they would figure out how to extract the Philosopher's Stone the stone from the ether and the reason they wanted to do that was because with the philosopher's stone they could actually transmutate change impure metals like tin or copper into pure metals such as gold and silver and so the idea was that whoever was able to isolate the philosopher's stone would become rich beyond their wildest dreams right um, the problem with this is that um, turns out there is no ether and there is no philosopher's stone so the idea of transmutating one element into another was really not a possibility, at least not until the era of nuclear chemistry um, started, but that was 3,000, well, actually more like 300, 350 years too early for the process to actually take place now. So alchemy was kind of uh, dead in the water as far as what they were trying to achieve. But in the process of trying to get to to this impossible task that would never happen, um, what they ended up doing is setting up the stones, the, the baby steps, for what ultimately became chemistry. And when the 1600s AD took place, this is when something major happens. This is when alchemy ceases to exist and modern chemistry is born. And the reason why is because it's here that the scientific method gets established. Because up until this point, Everything with alchemy was a uh, mystery. And, and sometimes on purpose, people did not want others, others to you know, mimic what they were doing because they were afraid that they would find the ether before they did and be able to extract the philosopher's stone before they did and then you know, get screwed over in the process. So everything was kind of like left on purpose, kind of um, ambiguous and almost as riddles so it was not helpful and sometimes information that wasn't even necessary was included like what's the position of the stars you know and or what time at night uh, is the experiment being carried out and ultimately these things didn't matter whatsoever but they believed that they were important at the time so when the scientific method got established this is where a set of rules was put forward to make sure that information that is not necessary is omitted and information that may seem of importance could be actually proven to be important as opposed to just assuming that it is important. So when the scientific method is established, modern chemistry begins. The periodic table begins to take shape and form. Elements are found based on the periodic table and you start creating laboratories that you, know, you can actually have uh, materials saying handle materials and do constructive chemistry with with a proper understanding so what the scientific method basically is is it starts at something known 
as a hypothesis. The hypothesis is an educated guess as to why something is happening. Like you could look at an event and say, huh, this took place. I think it took place because of this. But you don't leave it as that. That will be your hypothesis. But in and of itself, it's just a guess. If you want to get something more out of it, you have to experiment. Do experiments that can prove or disprove whether your hypothesis is right or wrong. And the idea right here is that you don't take hard feelings against the result. The result is going to be what it is based on the rules of nature. If your understanding of nature is a little skewed, then your answer is probably going to be no when you perform the experiments. Your hypothesis is wrong. And if that's the case, you have to go back and reshape your hypothesis to explain why the process that you saw in the first place is happening. If the answer is yes, then you go back and create a new hypothesis. And by doing this over and over, what you end up doing is kind of shaping a roadmap of the underlying principles that may be at play that lead to such an event happening. So after this gets done a good number of times, eventually with the roadmap, you end up developing something known as the law. Now the law is, in essence, the combination of all these experimental uh, observations that have been made in the hopes of proving or disproving the, the different hypotheses. Um, and together, empirically, they kind of describe the results, but they don't come as close as to explaining them. They just say, okay, if you do this, if you mix A and B, C is going to happen. They go as to saying that, even kind of like making predictions, but they don't quite explain why it is actually happening. So that's more like a correlation that you ultimately do in terms of like the big picture. But once you see and you have this big picture, then you start saying, well, um, let's see if the law makes sense. Let's make predictions based on the law. And if you continue getting answers that validate the law, then the law becomes stronger and stronger in terms of its uh, regard in the scientific world. If the answer is no, then your law basically kind of ceases to exist and you have to go back and try to come up with a better explanation for everything you've seen. And if enough times the law is validated, at one point you can turn it into a theory. Now, the point of the theory is not to say that, okay, you did enough experiments so that this qualifies as, as a theory, but rather here's the point where you introduce hard uh, empirical and scientific uh, evidence, you know, like some core concepts of science like physics and chemistry. And with those concepts as the starting points, you develop and derive an actual explanation of what's happening around you. So the theory is in fact the biggest, most robust portion of the scientific method. It tells you why some things are happening uh, and you know it basically predicts what things are going to happen and on top of that it summarizes the entire set of experiments that have been observed up until that point so the theory is everything it tells you what has happened how it's going to happen and why it's happening so the theory is the big dog the big dog of the scientific method and it has basically held us together for more than uh, 400 years now so it's uh, it's something big and it's because of this that chemistry now is a science and just to give you a, a little bit of a perspective the when it comes up to the scientific method what's very important is that you do keep a proper laboratory notebook where you actually write down your procedures all the important information what solvents do you use what temperatures was this carried out for how long uh, what are the components you know uh, anything that people can go back and recreate your experiment is important and this is part of the scientific method things have to be reproducible if you did something but that something only happened once and no one else can reproduce it chances are you messed up and your quote-unquote result is nothing more than simply a lack of oversight on your part all right uh, one last thing that I'm going to mention is uh, now chemistry that we have defined it and we've gone through the history of it to some extent. There are certain branches of chemistry that are uh, important. You could think of them as subcategories of chemistry. Now chemistry overall is the science of 
matter, you know, anything that's matter related uh, and the composition of matter and the transformations of matter, that's what we regard as chemistry. But there are different ways in which you can um, concentrate on the various facets of matter. One of them is called inorganic chemistry. And this is quite simply put, the chemistry of the periodic table. All the different elements in the periodic table represent the you know, chemistry of um, inorganic materials. On the other hand, the chemistry of specifically carbon is what we regard as organic chemistry. And believe it or not, this single element has quite a versatile amount of uh, reactivity and and just a propensity to form a vast number of structural motifs that can have ultimately um, biological roles. So the chemistry of carbon is the, or is organic chemistry. The chemistry of everything else in the periodic table is inorganic chemistry. Then you have biological chemistry, which is technically for the most part, organic molecules with a few inorganic in there for, you know, for good mix and completion sake, uh, you have molecules that now are part of living organisms. And if you have molecules in living organisms, this is regarded to as biological chemistry. Uh, typical molecules are proteins, DNA, RNA, sugars, lipids, um, anything that makes up cells and that cells utilize to carry out their functions those molecules will have a biological role. Then there is physical chemistry, which is where the hardcore theory of chemistry basically comes from. Uh, physical chemistry is the boundary between physics and chemistry. And you could even argue the point that physical chemistry is the boundary between physics, chemistry, and math altogether. And so most of the, the theories that are uh, most profound, uh, most complicated, they derive from physical chemistry, but physical chemistry itself also relies on experiments, so you do carry out various experiments. Some of them involve lasers, as a matter of fact. Then you have analytical chemistry, which is the portion of chemistry that um, concerns itself with measurements. Measurements of volumes, measurements of masses, measurements of um, you know, various things, masses, volumes, and uh, time, for instance. You, you can actually make various measurements of that sort. And by and large, these are quantitative measurements, right? You use glassware to make your measurements, you use balances. And finally, you have nuclear chemistry, which is the chemistry of nuclear transformations, transformations at the nucleus of the atom. In this class, we're actually going to concentrate on inorganic uh, analytical and physical chemistry. Um, we probably won't get to nuclear, unfortunately, even though it's kind of a fun topic to talk about, but for sure we'll touch upon analytical, physical, and inorganic. So those will be the three big ones in this class. All right, so with all that being said, I'm gonna stop the video right here, and on the next one, we'll continue and start talking about units.